Welcome guys to um, Dogs of War YouTube channel. Um, my name is Jesus. And I'm Angelo. And today we're going to have an uh, unboxing for the Stro Home for Game of Thrones. What do you think about the cycle? Um, this cycle's been interesting so far. The prize mechanic was an interesting introduction by FFG to kind of shake up the way cards were being played. And I don't think until this pack we've really seen characters and cards in general that have been worthy of the prized uh, power on them. But definitely in this pack you start to see where some of the cards we're going to go over are definitely worth the prized value that are on them. You can start to see some of those really powerful effects come into play. So I'm really interested to see what the last two packs in the cycle are going to include to see if they're going to drive this mechanic home. Now the interesting thing that I'd like to you know, talk, touch on real quick is that FFG has said even going forward into the next cycles we're going to see more prize mechanics. Which is good. Yes, so I, I think it's going to be interesting to see where they take prize and how it's going to continue to help sh shape the meta because we have definitely seen cards in the last four packs that have been a little underwhelming when it comes to giving them prized value. And it makes you wonder where are these powerful cards that FFG had said are going to be worthy of that prized power that's going to be on them. And I think we start to see some of them in this pack. So I'm really excited about it. Uh, I guess we should introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Jesus. I'm the store owner of Dogs of War Gaming. Um, been playing card games for like 20 years already. Um, I've been playing Game of Thrones for the last year and a half. Um, um, very seriously playing Game of Thrones like year and a half. Been playing it for like two or three years, but it was more casual. Um, I do play Netrunner, Cthulhu, um, Star Wars, and hopefully Warhammer 40,000. And I'm Angelo. Um, I've been playing here at the shop for about a little, a little over a year now. I've um, been playing Game of Thrones for about the same time. Actually, my first time here at the shop playing was in a Game of Thrones tournament. Uh, turns out clansmen are not everything they were cracked up to be when I first thought. Uh, I dived in very deeply, though, into Game of Thrones, and I've been playing with pretty much the entire card pool for about the last year now. Um, Lannister is my primary house, and I happen to love them quite a bit, and I was very proud to see people like Alvaro take them all the way last year, which is very cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it, it's going to be interesting to see where the, this cycle continues with my, my boys, the Lions, but some of the other factions have definitely, and ho houses rather, have definitely picked up uh, some interest for me as well. I play other card games as well, like Jesus does, as well as some tabletop gaming, so I'm not new to the gaming world at all, so I think we should uh, get this started. Okay, start with you. Sure, so uh, the first card in this pack is uh, Renly Baratheon. He's a Baratheon character, three cost, three strength. Uh, he's a Tricon with the Lord trait. No Crest, which is important to note, as most Renlies in the past have had the Noble Crest. He's prized one, and he reads, Marshalling, kneel a Baratheon character, lower the cost of the next character you play this phase by X. Where X is the number of prized cards that you control, limit once per round. So this is a really cool ability. Baratheon, more than any other house so far, has gotten some really good prized characters, but just a general good amount of prized cards in general. So what we get to see here is Renly drops himself into play and you can kneel any Baratheon character to reduce cost for other characters after that point. And this is really cool because we see a lot of characters in Baratheon that are zero and one cost characters that really don't have powerful abilities on them, they're one strength, but now all of a sudden they can be a repeatable seat of power for instance each turn, which is just fantastic for Baratheon. Um, I can see this guy slotting in very well into Renown decks, things like Noble Cause where you want to be able to flood the board very quickly with lots of characters, and that deck lives or dies by its economy. So yeah. having a repeatable usage seat of power, essentially, every turn is very, very powerful. powerful. Do you think it's, uh, can he see played currently, or does he still need more cards to make it? I definitely think he sees played currently. He's fantastic because he's not a king, in which we know there's several king choices in Baratheon already. Yeah. So you can drop him as just another lord, uh, a Tricon at three strength is fantastic. You know, he can attack or defend any challenge on the board, even if it's just to give that little chump block so that they're not claiming the unopposed power. So I'm always a big fan of well-costed Tricon characters with a decent strength. And this is a card that definitely deserved the prize value on it. Um, paying three gold, again, for a three strength Tricon is just fantastic. You know, so giving him that prize one feels very balanced, especially with the fact that, you know, he reduces characters coming into play too, so... Isn't there like a, a Lord theme that you can make with him too? Yeah, Baratheon has a lot of Lord subtext to it. Um, we've already seen in the next cycle coming out that the Rainbow Guard, which is you know the King's Guard version for Baratheon, is going to get a lot of help. And a lot of those usually have abilities or 
uh, effects that actually directly affect lore characters, giving them stealth, giving them more strength, giving them renown. So we can definitely see where the lore trait becomes more and more powerful out of House Baratheon as the cycle continues and we go into the next one. Okay. The next one is uh, Liseni, Captain. Um, three costs, three strength, military and power, naval on military, prize one. He's a smuggler captain and has response. After you play Lesney, Lesney, captain, play two gold to move all power from a character to himself. I really like this card. Um, I, it's for the first, when I first look at it, I think about um, the... Guy cannot be killed. Uh, Barrack. Barrack. A great answer for Barrack. So he's at 14 power. You play him, pay two go, move all 14 powers to him. And, you know, it's very, very, very good. Um, also, he's a smuggler. There's a smuggler sub team to yep. there, too. Um, he's another naval for Black Sails. Um, and I think that's the important part about this guy. Uh, Baratheon, more so than any other house, loves Black Sails. Yeah. And while he's well costed for what he does, he doesn't have a really fantastic effect except in a very limited use case. True. So I think in Baratheon Black Sails, he's a very good choice. Not only do you want him for the naval icon, but he's that toolbox that just sits in your hold until you have to come up against a Barrack or a Red Viper, for instance. Which, uh, as we've seen. Immune to character abilities, right? No, because this actually targets the power on the character and not the character itself. So the power is still eligible to be removed. Really? Yes. So oh, wow. the CD captain, it's important to note, he can pick the power off of the Viper because you're not actually targeting the Viper with the effect. You're actually targeting the power on the Viper. Oh, wow. I wasn't aware of that. I and as we've seen, the Viper is what wins games for Martell. True. Um, you can say what you will about characters like Quentin and, you know, the Sands and everybody else who's in Martell, but nine games out of ten, I guarantee you are closed out by a two the Spears turn with the Viper, or several turns with the Viper not kneeling. You drop this guy into play and you say, guess what, you gotta do it all over again. Mm -hmm. And again, for Barrick, it's fantastic. Um, I know the, the national meta and even the global meta doesn't really see Barrick decks anymore, but we see them around here, and I still think they have their place if you're not ready for them. Yeah. We've watched Barrick decks rush and win turn one, and it's brutal to have to play against that. And even if they don't win turn one, to be able to go get this guy or hopefully draw into him so you, when he gets to that 13 or 14 power and say, guess what, go do it all over again, or even more importantly, you just straight up win the game is fantastic. Um, great for melee. We've seen Baratheon get these really big surgeons of cards that allow you to take your opponent's characters away from them. Um, Mel's Favor was a perfect example. Yep. Same thing, you know, the guy's got a lot of power on him, drop Mel's Favor on him, take him, win the game. That's so, true because Mel Favor with this guy, you could do a very big swing power you very much could you know and our for you guys know we do play um, pretty good a lot of melee here in our store um, so when we see cards we will put the melee um, advantage of the card if it's good for you or not and again the smuggler traits fantastic um, uh, once again we've seen with the next cycle they're all about these lesser done traits and all the houses and they're gonna beef them up and I can definitely see smugglers being one of those they've already got some support I can see them getting a lot uh, more all right, next up, we've got the first of the titles in this pack. This is Warden of the South. Uh, it's the Baratheon title. It's zero cost, unique attachment, uh, title traded. It's prize two, attached to your house card. Response, after you play a prize card, kneel attached house card to choose an opponent. That opponent must choose and reveal a new plot card. I will say right off the bat, this is a perfect example, I think, where FFG failed with the prize mechanic. This card is not worth price two, in my opinion, at all. Okay. Uh, attachment hate is so prevalent these days and so easy to do. We've already seen most people move away from attachments in almost every deck we've got. And the new Viserys just rips this card apart. So we know that plot cycling is already a powerful effect. And unfortunately, this card does not allow you to plot cycle. It forces your opponent to do it by playing even more prize cards onto the board. And... The worst part is, with rivers being what they are right now in the current state of the game, an opponent would love for you to play this against them. You're going to give me another river trigger in the same turn? Sure, thank you. Even worse, though, is they'll just flip into Valor if you've just played a prize character to trigger this if they want to. So are they already losing the board presence and you drop a prize character and you trigger this response thinking you're going to flip them out of to the spears and into something else? Sure, they'll flip into Valor. 
But do you think it will be a good card for, again, um, going back to Black Sails, for a, a toolbox? Like, if they're playing against a, a rush deck, a uh, holy rush deck, mm -hmm. they go with the holy plot, you play this and hack them, skip that. Or against Martell with their To the Spears turn, or Greyjoy when they go in the big power attack. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely think it has its case, and I think once we see the rivers die down, it may be sure. a more commonly played yeah. card. Not with the rivers, it's kind of rough. Yeah. I just don't like any card that allows your opponent to choose what plot they're going to move into. And not to mention, we already have a character that does this anyway. So now we get a card that doesn't give us any challenge board presence, and does the same thing that we have Marjorie Tyrell from previous cycles that already does anyway. Okay. So it's a very hard case for me to justify running this in a deck right now. Um, and if you're playing against a Targaryen player, you're never going to put it into play. Because they're just going to kneel Viserys and remove it. Every Targ deck right now is running Viserys. And that's an instant two power for them the moment you drop this on the board. I agree, but also it would be nice to, whenever they go for Fear Winner, Good. play it to move it away. So it, it, it is, it's done what FFG, I think, wanted, which was, are you willing to risk the power that you're going to have to give up to play this card? Yeah. And then you have to make the decision, if I ever use this in a deck, am I going to get enough work out of it that when I draw it, I'm happy to see, see it? it. And I just don't think with the river plots being what they are right now, you're ever going to want to drop this card on the board. Now, maybe next cycle we'll see something different where rivers go away if they do something about Mummer's Ford, for example, um, where you may want your opponent. But it's so easy for your opponent to look at what plot you have revealed and go, okay, so what do I need to beat that this turn? And I think it may be for, for a toolbox thing, but yeah. Yeah, 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 I think you're right. Okay, next we got the first of the Great Joys. We got uh, Great Wick. I'm bad at smelling. Nope, that's correct. Great work. <laughs> two, gold, um, two gold, unique. Um, it's in Iron Island, any phase. Neo Grey Wick to choose another location. Neo or stand that location. I I like it. Um, because for a, on a choke deck, to count choke deck, you bring reducers mm -hmm. into your deck. Um, and this kind of negates the reducers. Um, it's unique, so, um, but what do you think? So as somebody who <laughs> has been beaten by warships time and time <laughs> again, I would like to point out that I'm happy this is not another warship for one. <laughs> uh, being Iron Island that's traded is fantastic. It's not a warship, which means it's a little bit more balanced. But again, going back to the whole prize mechanic cycle, this is probably one of the most powerful cards we've seen in this cycle so far. This one? This card is bonkers. You will run this even out of house. It's worth four gold for most wow. houses. And I'll explain why in a minute. <laughs> but the problem with this is, is this is a definitely a card that should have had prize value assigned to it. And the fact they didn't do it really makes you wonder what their decision points are for when are we going to put prize on the card and when we're going to not do it. I run this card out of house because this means I can trigger the Iron Throne twice in Lannister. This means I can stand up another Pentoshi Manor and trigger it again. This means my reducers, my Streets of Silk, my Street of Steel, my Street of Sisters, all can be used multiple times. But even more importantly, I can use this on the offensive too. I'm playing against a Greyjoy player, kneel your Maiden's Bane before you can trigger it. Kneel your Naval Escort before you can trigger it. This is a very good answer card for a lot of houses to consider running and paying the four gold for. Wow. Being able to either repeatedly use your own reducers or your own cards, or to kneel out your opponent's problem locations before they can trigger them is fantastic. This wrecks Aegon's Hill, which is a card I hate seeing a target player drop into play, because when you're playing against Targ Burn, a lot of times you want to hold characters back in your hands, so you want them to burn those effects before you drop your Cersei or your Tywin or your Rob Stark into play. So you'll feed them Chuds instead to get the burn out of the way, so then you can drop those characters and play them. The moment they play Aegon Sill, that character is no longer safe, and what are you going to do? This is a great answer for that. Kneel your Aegons before you can trigger it. Uh, going back to House Lannister again, um, fantastic to be used with something like Lannisport Brothel. I can kneel Lannisport Brothel to kneel one of your characters, keep it knelt, stand it with this, and keep another one knelt again. And I'll just re-kneel it again. So that's two characters in the standing phase that are not standing up from your side. So I think there's a lot of value even out of house for this. In-house, this is amazing. I mean, it's bad enough that Naval Escort doesn't have to be knelt to trigger its effect, but now you can kneel other warships like Longship Iron Victory, stand it back up and kneel it again. Because with Longship Iron Victory, the draw a card after you win the challenge effect is passive so once you've triggered it it stays as a persistent state you can use longship iron victory again and draw two cards off the end of that challenge oh nice or if you're a Greyjoy player like you said with choke i'm going to kneel out your reducers on the other side of the board so i think this card is fantastic i think we're going to see it end up in a lot of decks especially out of house 
And I think it's going to be one of the cards that helps shape the game going forward for the next, you know, at least few packs until oh, we wow. start to see something. Do you think better. Is every Grey Dre deck is going to have one? At least one copy. At least one copy. Second title. All right, so we got a uh, King of the Isles. It's a one-cost, unique attachment, Greyjoy. Uh, title traded. Prize three. Attached to your house card. Response. After you play a prize card, kneel King of the Isles. Then until the end of the round, King of the Isles gains. Response. Kneel attached house card to cancel a triggered effect. Again. They already. This is redundant. It's redundant for Greyjoy. Yeah. They already have this in so many different ways, and it doesn't cost them three power to do it. Again, with so much attachments coming out, we're going to see attachment hate make a huge resurgence, and it already has in Viserys. <laughs> yeah. So again, I hate using Viserys as a counter to all these cards, but it is a threat in the current meta that you have to be worried about. Targ is very popular, Targ Burn is even more popular, and the one thing Targ Burn hates to see is attachments on characters. So what do they do? They bring Viserys as an answer. And again, you're giving an effect to Greyjoy that already exists. So of course, the counter argument that people have made I've seen is, well, you could at least use the effect that you gain to cancel the effect to discard it. Then you've netted out with nothing out of the card. So now you're not getting anything at all to cancel the effect that would prevent it from being discarded from play. So you and your opponent are now in a stalemate, essentially. And on top of that, I don't think Greyjoy has enough prize cards right now to even make this triggerable every turn. There are some good Greyjoy prize cards, but there's not enough that I think you'd be dropping one into play every turn to want to even yeah. get the effect triggered. That's one thing with the titles is you need to play with a lot of prize mm -hmm. to make it, you know, to be able to use it more than once. And prize three is steep. I think it's one of the few. I don't know if we've seen any of the prize three cards, and if we have, there can't be many because I don't remember them. So this has got to be one of the most expensive prize cards we've seen so far. And for a redundant effect, I just don't understand why they felt it was worth it. Um. The interesting thing to note, though, none of these titles are actually house restricted, which is very interesting. And oh wow! A lot that. of people haven't touched on this that I've heard about yet, but you could, in theory, play these out of house. Wow! I don't wow. necessarily know why you would want to for a lot of them. Yeah, because if your faction doesn't have true, if you don't have house. cancel, but again, now you're paying three gold for this. It's prize three, yeah. and on top of that, you still have to be playing other prize cards. So of course, it'll trigger itself on the turn it comes into play. But after that, if you're not playing a lot more prize cards, it doesn't work. Now, maybe there's some janky neutral deck you'll see floating around where they <laughs> want to run titles. There's nothing that says you can't run multiple titles. It's True. just you only be able to trigger one around because you have to kneel your house card. But it is important to note, they don't actually say House Greyjoy, House Lannister, or House Martell only on any of these. They're just attached to your house card. So something to keep in mind. Okay, next we have Set Sail. Uh, it's an event. House Great Joy only. Response After you win an opposed challenge, search your deck for a worship location, reveal it, and add it to your hand. Then shuffle your deck. I think this is pretty good. It's, you know, get all the good worships they have, mm -hmm. you know, um, thinning your deck, you know, mm -hmm. uh, one less location in your, in your deck. Um, and it's unopposed, which is what Greyjoy does. You know, they're very good. Um, what do you think? I think this card goes both ways. I can see uses for it when you're running low warship count decks. So you're not running the typical what you're seeing right now where some of these decks are running 23 to 27 warships in them. I think it would limit, limit also the duplicates. It would. Um, but again, how many of these are you going to slot into your deck to be able to go tutor for one warship? Because there's really, if I think off the top of my head, two ships that any Greyjoy player probably wants to see on turn one or two, and that's Longship Maiden's Bane and Naval Escort. After that, you really don't care which ones you draw into because you just need them to fuel those two warships. But I think if you're running a deck that doesn't rely on those two as much, so like maybe a more classic Greyjoy unopposed deck, you want to see things like Longship Iron Victory pretty fast because it's your draw engine. So... How many copies, though, of your event slots, which are already packed in Greyjoy with cancel events, are you going to rip out to put set sail in? Yeah. Is but I was problem. thinking, instead of bringing, playing two of each of those cards, mm -hmm. playing one of each, and then two of this. You could do that. Or, you know, I think this will take the slot of a duplicate, you know. Yeah, um, and, and Greyjoy is known for unopposed, but you can play around that, too. So the response is a little bit difficult for them to challenge later in the game. So usually the first two or three turns with Greyjoy, you'll see them get a lot of unopposed challenges until you're, you get enough of a board presence. Now, you have somebody like Wex Pike, who's just fantastic. Not the new one, but the old one where, you know, you can't defend against him unless you have a crest. Yes. Would make this very easy to trigger. 
But, you know, the requirement is draw this into your hand, not have already drawn that warship you want to go to or for, win an unopposed challenge, play this event, hope it doesn't get cancelled, which is a great card in this pack that will cancel this easily, <laughs> and then go get your warship. And it, if it was put into play, I think it would be fantastic. Instead, it goes into your hand, the and then you have to play it the next turn. So if this was prized one and put into play, I think you'd see more Greyjoy players excited about it coming out. But I do like Tutor, don't get me wrong. I think Tutor, as we've seen in, in both this card game and other card games, is a fantastic ability. It just depends on how much is tied to that Tutor that you have to do to trigger it. Trigger. And I wonder if this isn't too much sometimes. Yeah. So we'll see. Well, guess who you get, the nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> so probably one of the most exciting cards in the pack for myself as a Lannister player, but in general, I think a lot of people, when they saw this card spoiled, were very excited for him. This is Tyrion Lannister. Uh, unique Lannister character, four cost, three strength. He's an intrigue power icon. He's a lord. He's prize two in stealth. And he has a passive ability that reads as follows. If you win a challenge in which Tyrion Lannister attacked alone, instead of the normal claim effects, reveal a card from the losing opponent's hand at random. You may put that card into play under your control if able, otherwise you discard it. And he is also a learned crest character. This card is fantastic. The only criticism I could possibly make about FFG printing this card, beyond the artwork, which I think is a little weird for a Tyrion, is that I don't necessarily agree that he should have been priced too. If he had been priced too, I would have liked him to see him had either 3 cost and 3 strength, or 4 cost and 4 strength. And the reason I say that is because, again, prize was supposed to be that mechanic where we were supposed to get bonkers abilities on characters that were worth the fact that if they get killed or discarded from play, your opponent's going to claim power. Now, is his ability good? It's fantastic, yes, don't get me good. wrong. But it, for one to note, it's claim replacement. So on any two claim challenge plot turn, you're never going to want to trigger his ability nine times out of ten. Because you're going to actually get less cards out of their hand than if you were just doing your regular challenges as an intrigue attack. Interestingly enough, though, you can use him as a power challenge or a military challenge if you have Podrick in plane and play, who we saw last cycle, to give him the military icon to also act as an intrigue challenge as well, because again, he just replaces the normal claim and you pull the cards out. So, for him to win a challenge by himself, he has to stealth your opponent's characters, which he has stealth, which is fantastic, but he still has to actually win the challenge at three strength, which I think is actually kind of difficult later in the game. Early game, he's going to be fantastic. If you draw into him first turn, or even better, you can play him on setup, knowing that your opponent isn't running something like March to the Wall, and get him on turn one, I think you'll get a lot of work done with him. Um, he combos very well with a lot of cards we've recently seen. Um, Podrick Payne being a good example. You know, you can take that military challenge, which, you know, maybe your opponent has no characters on the board, or just nobody you really care about killing, and get straight claim replacement to another Intrigue challenge to get a card out of their hand. Yeah, they basically get another Intrigue challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, first turn, if you're running, uh, you know, other entry characters on the board, and you know you're going to win challenges with them, you use him in a power challenge instead, because there is no power to steal from your opponent, you get the unopposed power anyways for winning the challenge, and you get a third card out of their hand if you're running like Power Behind the Throne, for example. So yes. there's some interesting combinations there. Um, I'm, what's the, the new one, uh, there's no men like me, give him a military icon, he doesn't kneel to attack, or defend military challenges, now you get two challenges a turn out of him. Uh, you can use him with uh, called by the was it called by the council or whatever it is the uh, no, schemes of the scholar, which all learned crest characters do not need to attack during intrigue challenges. So you can get multiple challenges off of him that way. And you can trigger him multiple times. Yes, you can. It, there is no limit to the number of times you can wow. trigger his ability. So I think it's really cool because recently in the meta we've seen the reveal and add to hand mechanic has reduced the value of intrigue challenges significantly. Back when I was playing Lannister and we saw the average hand size was five to seven cards, a two claim intrigue challenge is actually pretty rough on your opponent. That was very hard to come back from, especially if you're playing power behind the throne and actually got four cards out of their hand. But even two cards a turn was rough for an opponent with five cards average in hand to yeah. deal with. But now we're seeing hand sizes of average of 12 to 15 cards in any given turn. And now the intrigue challenge doesn't really matter anymore. Your two cards is a drop in the bucket to what they're drawing into each turn. And so, Intrigue as a challenge has become less valuable. It's no longer that way with this guy. Being able to pull those characters and locations, or even attachments, out of your opponent's hands and put them directly into play swings the card advantage massively in your favor. Do you have to pay for them? No, no. they are directly put into play. You can pull a Northern Cavalry flank out of your opponent's hand and drop it into play. They don't come into play knelt, which means they can still initiate challenges that turn. 
If they're a location, they come into play, you can trigger effects on it. He's very, very good as a claim replacement. Now the other thing to, and I'm going to harp on this because I'm a Lannister player, that's really <laughs> cool about him, is there's a lot of effects in Lannister that allow you to remove characters from a challenge before the challenge resolves. So you can attack with him and another character, another stealth character for instance, to get double stealth to bypass your opponent's board, play uh, Walk of Shame as an example, stand that character, remove it from the challenge, and now he's won the challenge by attacking alone. Oh, it will trigger? Yeah, so the requirement for this is he just has to, when the challenge is resolved, he has to be the only character participating in the challenge. Because there's no longer any attackers. Wow. So there are several effects in House Lannister that do the same thing. Walk of Shame's an event. Um, one of the two Lannister locations, which I always forget, I think it's, I don't think it's Lion's Gate. There's another one that it's uh, stand and remove a non-unique character from participating in the challenge. So again, there's plenty of Lannister characters that are non-unique that have stealth. Attack with both of them, remove the one after you, you know, your opponent doesn't declare any defenders, only declares the one that you're going to win. Challenge is yours. It's wow. fantastic. Think he's the best Tyrion? Um, he slots into everything but a Shadows every deck. I still think Shadows Tyrion has his place. Um, Shadows Tyrion, the problem I've always had with him is people's ease of removing him from play. Renown right now is a very flaky thing unless you're winning the game with him. So Shadows Tyrion is one of those cards you'll always keep in Shadows until you're gonna, the turn you're going to win the game. Because otherwise he's just going to die next turn. They're going to Valor, they're going to burn him off the board if they're a Tark player. You know, they'll find some way of removing him because he's that powerful of a card. Um, this guy, they'll try to do the same thing, but I think the claim replacement is what makes him even more fantastic than anything but in a straight shadows. You'll, you, you'll get a card for it. If you, you know? pull locations, let them battle the board. Who cares? You're taking their gold producers, you're taking their reducers, they're taking their, you know, their longship iron victories, you're taking their longship maiden's bane. I imagine Lannister with a longship maiden's bane. That <laughs> is good. awesome, you know? I mean, there's some really cool stuff you can do yeah. with them. So I'm very excited. I just, like I said, I would have liked to see him as a three cost character or a four strength character. Um, the only other thing to note is he's very, very good with the upcoming cycle that we're about to see. We saw the new agenda that was spoiled in the new locations. They love four cost characters. Now he becomes a two cost character if you're running the new agenda, and the new reducer makes him free. Oh, wow. So these new four cost characters we're seeing are going to tie in very, very well with the next cycle we're about ah, to see come out. I like when they have some synergy within cycles. Yep. Very good. So next we have a location. One cost. The Westeros lands. Lannister. Uh, prize one. Response. After an opponent's character is knelt by one of your character's no, cards effects, choose and kneel a location. Limit three times per phase. I know you really like this card. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great card. <laughs> if it's great for Lannisters, because you guys have a lot of kneeling characters, mm -hmm. abilities. So now you're taking their characters out, out of the picture, and now you're taking their reducers, their locations out of the picture. So it's putting Lannister into a very, very controlling house, um, giving you very powerful control. Um, <coughs> it's limited three times per phase, so most times you don't have that many locations. Um, even if you run that plot that destroys all land except for three, you, you have this in play, and you have a lot of kneeling, you control the board. Definitely. Um, this is the card that Lannister needed to become competitive again in the current game state. Um, once they re-restricted Pentoshi Manor, we saw Lannister stop winning tournaments. We saw them stop being very competitive in the game, simply because of the reason we talked about earlier. Intrigue challenges just don't matter as much anymore, and that's what Lannister used to be good at. Um, we saw that great deck that Alvaro and Bruno piloted through Worlds last year. It was fantastic. And then we see Pentoshi go back on the restricted list. Um, the hard part I've always had with Lannister, and I know we've had this argument before, is... Do all three of the Lannister cards that are on the restricted list right now deserve to be there? Do we really need to see both Pentoshi, Castle, and Empire Mancers cash on the list? I think there's a good argument from Pentoshi. I don't necessarily agree with the current meta that there is a good argument for not having either Pyro's cash or Castle and taken off the list. Um, but this card gave Lannister what they needed again to become competitive again, even with having all three of those cards on the list. Lannister struggles very hard against Tarkburn and Greyjoy Old Way. Most other matchups they can do very well with. They struggle still against some of the Martell crazy shenanigans out there just simply because Martell gets more intrigue icons on the board than almost any other house does other than Lannister. And this gives you the answer that you need. This allows you to play Castle and as you're restricted, and every time you drop a Lannister card and you trigger his limited response, you kneel a character, I'm going to kneel your Longship Maiden's Bane. I'm going to kneel your Aegon's Hill. I'm going to kneel your you know, Lost Oasis, which you know is the bane of all Lannister yeah. decks. But even more importantly, this is triggered by the character being knelt and not the effect that's actually kneeling the character. 
So you can play Harry the Riverlands, kneel three characters with it, and kneel out three locations. That's as each character is knelt, you kneel a location, not each kneel effect that is triggered. So if you can get multiple kneel out onto the board, you can kneel multiple locations. Now, unless I'm mistaken, this also works very well with what the other thing that Lannister loves the most, which is city plots. You pop City of Sin, kneel three characters, that card's considered under your play, kneel out three locations during the plot phase, which can be huge before you go into marshalling. There's no way to stand them up unless they're running Great Wick, which, yeah, you know, look at this. And I, I just think it's great. It's well-costed. It deserves the prize one. Again, this is an example where I think FFG seriously got it right. I think even if this card was limit three times per round, it would be well-played. Um, is it an HOD location, which is something else Lannister likes to look at? I don't necessarily know. I'd like to try it as one, just simply because I can see decks where this will just wreck them. And I think Castellan might go back to being the restricted <laughs> choice for Lannister because of this card. It's so. a very good card. Do you think people play out of faction? Out of um, I keep saying faction, is that a house? You could, but the problem is there's not a lot of Neil effects, effects in other houses. So, just for... The, the city plots wouldn't be, be... There's city plots. Um, we've seen some neutral cards come out recently which have some Neil tied in there if you're trying to run some janky mercenary type deck or whatever. Okay. Um, we saw the new guy. Uh, I cannot remember his name to save my life. When you play a mercenary character, choose a Neil character and play. But again, they just don't have as much access to Neil effects as we do. And I think, you know, that's why this doesn't even say House Lannister only because I think you'd be a little crazy to try and run it out of another house <laughs> in all honesty. It's your turn. Oh, Warden of the West. I keep getting the titles. Uh, <laughs> this is the two cost unique, a Lannister attachment, which is a title trait. It is prize three, so as we just saw in the Greyjoy one. Uh, attached to your house card. Response After you play a prize card, kneel attached house card to choose a kneel character and discard all power on that character. I will say, out of all the titles that we're going to see in this pack, I think this is the one that got it right on. This does, again, something that Lannister has always needed, which is some way to deal with power characters. But. One thing good, if you notice, compare this with the Greyjoy one. The first effect is, you guys already have it. Mm -hmm. What makes it great, I think, is the second effect you guys don't have. Yep. And which, if you looked at the Greyjoy, does not have. Yep. So, I can tell you as a Lannister player, there's nothing more frustrating than going five rounds against Beric and keeping him knelt out. And then when all of your Neil effects run out, that's when he starts winning the game. So now with this card, I can let him... I can save those Neil effects in my hand, let him get to that 13 or 14 power, then drop that enemy informer, or actually, not an enemy informer, but in this case, a prize card, essentially. Even this card, actually. I could just keep this and use it because it triggers itself. Yeah. Neil Barrick out again that turn, discard all of his power, and the board's back to square one. Um, there's other videos on this channel where you've seen me lose as a Lannister player with 13 power on my house card to a Barrick deck that just goes off and gets to 15, and there's nothing more frustrating. Yeah, in our meta here locally, Barrack and Viper are very, very, you know, prominent. So we always lose a lot to those decks. So I'd like to point out the interesting combo here since we have these two cards sitting next to each other in front of me with Warden of the West and the Westerlands that you just went over. I attach Warden of the West, which says after I play a prize card, I can kneel attached house card to then kneel a character and discard all power. Or I can play the Westerlands first, then play Warden of the West, trigger that to kneel a character, and then trigger the Westerlands to kneel a location. So we're seeing Lannister get what they've needed and they haven't seen in the last two cycles, which is they're going back to the core of what Lannister is, which is give us more kneel. If you want to make us competitive again, we need more control effects that allow us to kneel out characters. Because let's be fair, kneel is probably the least powerful of all the control effects, so they need to have more of them. Because kneel is very easily overcome in the current meta. There's a lot of stand, there's a lot of, you know, just your character comes back the next turn. It's not like burn where they're just removed from play. It's not like... Iron, uh, Longship Maiden's Bay comboed with the old way where they just die in the challenge if they lose. So Lannister, to be competitive as a kneeling faction, needs consistent amounts of kneel effects to be able to at least control one to two characters a turn. I'd love if we could do three or four, but you know I think that's asking too much. So you know I'm, I'm happy to see the hyper-kneel concept coming back, because that's what I started Lannister with, and I hated moving away from it, and now I'm looking like I can probably move back to that again and do very well with it. Okay, next card. It's uh, I'm going to draw a blank now. Dorn Loyalist. The Dorn Dorn Loyalist. This is uh, three cost, three strength, military, and intrigue. He's an ally. Prize two, stealth. Response: Neil a prize character to cancel the effect of a character ability just triggered. Hmm. Um. 
it's an ability they already have already too. More you know, important, he's an ally with prize two. You know, allies easy to kill. Um, I don't know if the current meta is being played with allies. Well, the problem is this is coming out at the same time that refugees have been taken off the restricted sure. list. Yep. Dissension is in decks. I've yep. seen it. I've used it myself. And am I going to dissent your refugees off the board, or am I going to pop this guy and claim two power? Yeah, I don't like him. This is another case where FFG messed up with prized, in my opinion. I, uh, they, they could have bad cards in there. They can, and, <laughs> and I've heard people from FFG even say, we have to print bad cards to make yeah. you choose the good cards in the pack. But again, this guy does not deserve prize two. Quite frankly, he's a regular Dorn card, and all, a regular Martell card for that matter, in my, and as far as I'm concerned. He's a well-costed Martell ally that has a cool ability that never should be given the prize trait and he would see play. But instead, they gave him prize two, which he should really be one if they even thought it needed it. And I don't think you'll ever see a Martell player put this on the board. If he was House Dane, maybe, because Dane decks are becoming more powerful and having more Danes on the board is always a good thing. I just think they missed the boat with this guy. I really do. Yeah, and it's like I said, if the, if the response would be something they don't have access to, mm -hmm. like Neil. Yeah. <laughs> then yes, but um, for something they already have in house. Yep. I just I just don't see it being played. Yeah, that much. Man, you're the title man. I am really <laughs> doing all the titles today. Uh, so next up we have the uh, the Prince of Dorn. This is a uh, one cost unique attachment again. Uh, it's prize three. So let me check real quick. Is this was the Baratheon one? Yeah. See the Baratheon one was prize two, but all the rest we've seen so far are prize three. So that makes you wonder why they considered Warden of the South, which is a free attachment, to be prize two. But all the rest, which actually cost money, become prize three. Uh, so this one's prize three attached to your house card. Uh, response: After you play a prize card, kneel the attached house card to look at the top five cards of your deck. Add one of those cards to your hand and shuffle the others back into your deck. This is a mechanic that you've heard me rate and rave about in the store over and over again. Bypassing the draw cap is not something that should exist in this game, in my opinion. Or if it does, it should be very limited. Had this card existed and they had never printed Mummers Ford or any of these other crazy reveal and add cards we've seen, this would be a well-balanced card and I could see Martell getting a good advantage out of it. It's cool because it doesn't do the thing I hate about Martell, which is they don't have to lose a challenge to trigger this. This is just, you know, play a prize card and look at the top five cards of your deck, add one of them to your hand and shuffle the rest back in. Important to note, you don't reveal that card to your opponent either. So you can just pick whatever those five cards are, your opponent will never know what it is and put it into your hand. But again, Martell is the king right now of drawing cards. They have managed to come up with a way to outdraw even Lannisters, which is mm -hmm. insane. Are you going to play this card for prize three and just watch it get pitched from the board? Your opponent's going to claim power off it, and you maybe trigger the effect once or twice. I will say Martell has got some interesting prize cards lately, so maybe you'll trigger this effect more than once per turn, which it doesn't have a limit on. No, it doesn't. Uh, actually, no, you have to kneel the house card, so it does. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. once per turn effect. But... I just don't know that it adds anything to the house that's worth the price three value on it. Again, maybe this is fantastic ran out of house. Maybe if you're playing Stark and you know you need some way of getting more cards in your hand and you don't want to run rivers, because if there's any house that probably doesn't want to run rivers still, it is probably house Stark because they have a lot of great plots that they need to claim power faster. So maybe they run this out of house, run some of the cool new Stark prize cards that we've seen, and it gives them another card effect to your hand. You know, getting a die by the sword or a no quarter without your opponent knowing about it can completely change the way a game plays. You expect a Stark player to have those cards in their hand, but you never know for sure. And now he can search the top five cards of his deck, pull it out, and then you don't even know he has it. I could see that being useful in some of the other houses, but as a Martell card, again, I just think they kind of missed the boat with these titles. Okay, uh, the first house Stark character is one cost. Um, Huster Tully, Strength 2, Power Icon, he's a Lord in House Tully trait, Price 1, Response, after H um, Huster Tully leaves play, search the top 5 cards of your deck for any number of House Tully cards, reveal them, and add them to your hand, shuffle the other cards back into your deck. I love this card. This card's great. card is very, 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 very good. Um, and it's not when he dies, it's when he leaves play. So if you could bounce into your hand or um, recur, um, recur him or something, you could trigger that ability multiple times. Um, and House Tully, I love that. I love playing House Tully decks. Um, the only thing is the getaway to making that ability we have him dead, getting killed, 
And in that case, you have lost the challenge, which in House Teller usually they don't like if you're running the, mm -hmm. the land. But he's a noble crest too. Um, I like him. I watched this card get played by one of our other players, Josh, who's trying to get back into Stark because he really wants them to be competitive again. And as a repeatable used family duty honor, it's very interesting as a card. Um, again, this is one of those cards where I think, weirdly enough, FFG hit it out of the park with for the price value. He's under-costed for his strength, and his ability is fantastic. Um, important to note, uh, from what I've read online, return to hand is not actually considered leaving play. Really? The return to hand effects ruled, if I remember correctly from the ruling I was reading the other day, return to hand is not actually considered as a card of leaving play. Um, cold hands works on him though, being killed, putting in your discard pile, all those effects work. So. Oh, I don't like that, because leaving place in play is no longer there. And I could be wrong about the ruling okay. that I read. You know, it may have been older and been overturned, but I, I know people have been asking about what can actually trigger his effect and how can I abuse it, and that's what they're looking for. Because if you can abuse this, you could run cards like uh, Call to Court, which pick a character up out of, your, out of play, put it in your hand, trigger his ability, and then you can play call, use Call to Court to put him right back into play, because that's what it does. So now I get to search top five five deck for any house telling no, cards. He works weird with the plot search. Um, River plots. He works. No, fantastic which is the with. one? The search detain is the one. Yeah, search and detain. Yeah. You could bounce them back. Although I don't know, you would waste your restrictive plot and start on this. But um, there's a lot of ways to actually trigger his ability multiple times, and I think he's a great combo for cold hands too. Yeah. Everybody should be running at least one copy of cold hands these days. That card's amazing. And you play him, you sack him to cold hands, so you're not really losing any real power on the board. I mean, he's not that great. Um, Prized one doesn't trigger unless he's dead or discarded. That's what's gonna ask. Yeah, you. so when Cold Hands eats him, he don't get prized one. So he left play because Cold Hands removes him from play. You trigger his ability. Then when Cold Hands eventually dies, he comes back into play. Then he dies for claim, or he gets discarded for some reason, and you get to trigger him again. So he's a re he's a repeatable card if you can abuse him. Can be very very powerful. And again. As we've already seen and I've talked about before, he's a lord and he's house telly, which are two traits we can expect to see get buffed up in the next cycle, I would imagine. So I think he's what they needed in melee. This guy's going to be a powerhouse. Um, house telly decks that want to not lose challenges and win in one turn, this guy's an awesome choice for. Very good. The Blackfish. This is another fantastic card. Stark got a lot of help this pack, which I think they really needed. Uh, four cost, unique character. He's three strength, military power. Uh, he's a lord with prize, knight, house tully, he's prized two with renown, and he has a passive ability while the blackfish is attacking, each character that dies for military claim gains prized one, and he has a war crest. This card is what Stark has been dying to get to make them competitive again in the current meta. I know a lot of people are saying that Stark No Agenda is fantastic, they've been having a lot of success, we've seen Mirror coming back with a vengeance and tournament reports. I think one of the biggest things that Stark suffers from is a lack of reliable renown and a lack of claiming power very effectively in a rapid manner. Stark is always the slow game. They will grind you out until the very end when they've won, you know, 15 unopposed challenges that they have to, and they'll get them eventually, and they'll, they'll win the game. Um, this gives them another option. Not only does he have renown, but every time he kills a character in military claim, which Stark has a ton of ways to raise claim with already, he claims a power. I ran him the other day in a Stark uh, Zerg deck, basically it was a Stark aggro deck. It's like 46 characters or whatever, and this guy was money the entire game. You know, you attack with him, even if you kill one dude, that's two power just for him alone participating in the challenge. And then, to, you know, the other part to remember too is that your kill effects that get triggered as responses to winning that challenge are all still part of that challenge phase. So you die by the sword somebody, another power. Um, no, it's dice for claim. Sorry. So yeah, it's only for claim. So I guess your other claim, uh, your other kill effects don't work. But I think he's what he needed. I think he makes Stark Siege even better. You saw Stark Siege want to just explode and turn one and two, play a lot of epic events, and just win that way. I think this gives them another option if they can't get those epic events into their hand. Now they're hitting you with two claim military challenges. They're getting multiples of them because the plots they're playing. And every time a character dies, yeah, have some more power. I think he's fantastic. Is he going to make that deck faster? He is. He, he is. very much is, because now you don't have to rely on getting those epic events in your hand. Yeah. So I, I think... that's uh, the Magical Four you were talking magical about. Magical Four! So next cycle, <laughs> he becomes a free character to drop into play next cycle, which I think is a, is a great concept. And again, he's a Tully, so Hoster dies, and hey, there's the Blackfish on the yeah. top of your deck. Now you've got his... Uh, is his he better buddy. than the, the champion Blackfish? Yes and no. I think they have their space in certain decks. I think if you're running Stark No Agenda, you may stick with the other Blackfish, although... I've never been a big Stark player, but every time I've tried to play with them, I felt the other Blackfish was very hard because I believe, if I'm correct, his ability requires you to have three power on him before it fires. And so that means you're winning three challenges with him to get power onto him, 
and then you can finally start pulling cards with him. Which, you know, if he stays in play long enough, <coughs> fantastic. <coughs> um, I like the fact that I can drop this guy on the board and get value out of him the same turn he comes into play. Very good arc. Yeah, fantastic artwork. Then you get the last title. <laughs> uh, Warden of the North. Uh, one cost, title attachment again. Uh, prize two, House Stark. Uh, attached to your house card. Yeah, that was me. Uh, right, I already you. got it, I guess. So, uh, response, after you play a prize card, kneel attached house card to choose a character. That character gains stealth and does not kneel to defend until the end of the round. So again, as not a Stark player, I'm probably going to get flamed by anybody who watches that <laughs> is a Stark player, but I actually think this is really good and provides something to Stark that they actually probably want, which is stealth. The not kneel to defend, you know, who really cares about that? It's not that big of a deal. How Stark usually has so many characters on the board that them losing a military challenge is not something that they're ever really going to care about. Important to note, it doesn't work on just military challenges, though, so you can, you know, defend with uh, the House Tully Septon guy, who's like a three-strength intrigue icon, who the only thing he can do is defend. So maybe you give him, you know, he can not kneel to defend an intrigue guy a challenge or something like that. But I think the stealth is the important part, because as we've seen in House Stark, um, being able to guarantee that you're going to win those military challenges turn after turn is important. And once your opponent can match you strength for strength on the board, stealth becomes very, very important. And I was playing a game just the other day with Josh. He was playing Stark. I was playing Stark. And we were both matched, you know, strength for strength. I was playing Wildlings for, as a good example. And all my Wildlings had stealth. There was nothing he could do to win a military challenge. Because I was just stealthing all of his guys. So even being able to give one Stark character stealth, I think, is going to be very important for them. Use this on Reek. Every person hates seeing Reek hit the board. Give Reek stealth and then watch him steal characters from their <laughs> opponent. I mean... There's a lot of ways where giving a character stealth when your opponent's not expecting I think is a very powerful ability. Um, we haven't seen a lot of prize cards for Stark. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers. Maybe each house maybe does have the equal amount, and they just don't stand out in my mind as being great. You know, we've seen Needle, we've seen the Blackfish, we've seen Hostertelli. And of course, again, it triggers its stealth itself. So it's going to be hit or miss, but I think surprise stealth is really, really cool. But do you think this will work good in a House Tully deck with the whole defend, not being able to defend um, well, hostilities want to defend, so yes, not being, not having to deal with defend, defend is really interesting. Um, you see cards that you'd want to probably use this on something like a three or four strength character or an army, for example. Maybe you want to use it on um, a Riders of the Red Fork or a Northern Cavalry flank, where they're strong enough and two icons that them not kneeling to defend one challenge means they won't. They'll still be able to defend the other no challenge, challenge as well. You don't want to use this on a monocon. Or, of course, anybody who has stealth, obviously, because that's just wasted. Um, so you wouldn't use it on Hodor, who can't be bypassed by stealth, as yeah. an example. But, yeah, I, I think, you know, they wanted to do something for House Tully in this pack, specifically, it seems like. And I think they've hit that on the head. So, yeah. Next one is Targaryen. It's two cost. Horse Lord. Strength two. Dothraki. Prize one. Um, has a power icon. While Horse Lord is participating in a challenge... Characters with more than one icon do not count their strength. I think it's very good. Yep. Um, it's I'm I, I like that new theme they're going to go with. They're going with the whole more than one icon um, because it's making these less favorable characters better. You know, um, the already the tricon with abilities are already you know strong as it is. So now, if you bring bring all you know, the good characters, now these guys are just going to run rampant. So, I may be wrong about this, <laughs> but I'm going to make a prediction right now. In the next six months, we're going to see a deck come out. I'm working on one, actually, where you're going to see these people be being screamed at to be restricted or banned from the game. Wow. So, let me tell you how powerful these cards are. This is the second one we've seen. Martell got the first one, which is the Spy from Starfall, who is a prized one character. Intrigue Icon, she's two strength, two cost, same thing. If you have more than one Icon, you can't defend against her. Do you think they're going to have one for each house? They do. We've already seen the spoiled one for Stark coming out in the next Ooh. cycle. They're going to get a military Icon in Stark. Okay, go ahead. So the problem with this is, is that two strength character will guarantee one challenges every game. Tree was playing against uh, Chris the other day, could not do anything about her. She's impossible to remove from the board unless you Valor. And are you really going to Valor to kill a two strength? Well, in this case, you're going to have to. These characters wreck the challenge phase. There are not a lot of monocons in the game. And in fact, if any house has access to the most of them, it's Lannister, and they're only one or two strength. So they're not going to win. You're going to have to have multiples on the board to even be able to defend this challenge. So let me explain this in a way that it'll actually make a lot of mm -hmm. sense. 
I'm working on a Noble Cause deck right now. We know I'm the only person in the store who's dabbled in <laughs> Noble Cause over time. And you know I had some success yes. with it. The problem was, though, is that the opponent, the minute your opponent can match you strength for strength on the board, Noble Cause loses. This guy prevents all that from happening. Because the important part about this is, all of your characters can attack in the challenge, even if they have more icons. Your opponent's never going to be able to defend unless they have a monocon. But, as long as you've won, Rear Renown still fires on every character in the challenge. This guy becomes a four-cost character. I've just won the game for Noble Cause in one turn. You drop him on the board, attack with everybody. All their Renown goes off because they can't defend the challenge. He's fantastic. The Intrigue Icon one's fantastic. The Military Icon one's fantastic. And when they're all three in the game, I will build a deck using all of them and you will never be able to defend a challenge against me unless you're playing That's what very, was. very specific cards that are capable of doing it. Um, important to note, Cold Hands can actually defend against him, but everybody only runs one of them in a deck. You're running three of these guys, the chances of them drawing in him are slim to none. And if you did, i just valid the board and play another one. So if they are going to make one for each house, I wonder if you could make a, a neutral deck with all of these guys. You could. Uh, it's not each house, it's just each icon. So we've seen it for... Oh, it's not each house. Yeah, it's, it's Martell, Stark, and uh, Targaryen that are getting oh, okay. So not each house is going to get okay. them so far that we've seen. It's just there's one for each icon. And the best part is, you only need one of them. So you hold the other two in your hand just in case this guy gets killed somehow, and then you just play the second one and go, okay, you're not defending power challenges again. It's brutal. The ability to push through challenges like that is absolutely brutal. And if somebody somewhere, probably not me, because I'm not the greatest deck builder <laughs> in the world, will find a way to abuse these cards to such an extent that I would not be surprised if people said we're screaming NPE against them at some point in time. Because having an entire board of 15 characters and you can't defend a challenge is awful. Even more important, they can defend. You attack with all your dudes that are tricons, bicons, who cares? I kneel one two strength guy and none of your characters count their strength. He wins the challenge for two strength. I mean, your house Stark. You have 50 strength and a power challenge on the board and you can't win because they're <laughs> all bicons? Because a two strength guy from the Dothraki says, hi, you can't count your strength. I think it's very, very cool. Do you think it'll make Dothraki viable? Uh, I think Dothraki already are viable because of Rivers now. Um, <laughs> rivers I, ironically enough, <laughs> any, aggro, any aggro deck, Rivers has given it a huge boost because they want to be able to continuously flood the board with characters. Um, again, I think it'll work great in Dothraki simply because he helps you push through more challenges. You know, Dothraki has a lot of strength. I don't think they really ever had a problem winning challenges per se. But now, you don't even have to commit your horde. You commit one guy to the challenge. You're not even attacking with the other 10 dudes on the board. You're attacking with one guy. And if you have two of them in play, you attack with one and leave the other one to defend. Um, he's like Yezin, you know, at a Lannister, who is an intrigue power icon, and when a character with a military icon is participating in a challenge, they don't count their strength. So you can give a military icon to Yezin to participate in a challenge, and it just nulls the challenge out completely. Um, I've won games based around even him, and he's worse than these guys are. <laughs> so I think you're going to see these guys come out with a vengeance. I think a lot of people are going to underestimate how powerful they actually are, and I think you're going to see a lot of decks come out that are just going to wreck face because of these cards. I guess the chicks like them. <laughs> they seem to, so... Now you all get, right. You get the one with the art you love. <laughs> Daenerys Targaryen. She is a three-cost unique Targaryen character, four strength, uh, intrigue power icon, lady queen, prize two. Response. After you declare Daenerys Targaryen as an attacker, choose a character without attachments controlled by the defending player. If you win the challenge, kill that character. So, here's where I'm going to gripe a little bit about how FFG <laughs> does prized balancing. I would almost argue this ability is more powerful than Tyrion's. Yet, notice she is less costed with more strength. It's very interesting that they went down that road with her. Now, here's my problem with it, other than the horrible artwork, which looks like it was done by a bad intern at FFG. <laughs> no offense if you're watching this. <laughs> but this artwork is probably the worst we've seen on a he card. Lives in Bay. Or a play <laughs> in a while. Um, besides that, I haven't played a lot of Targ, but I've played against a lot of Targ. As we know, we have a very good Targaryen player here in the, in the house that plays a lot of Targ Burn. Now, people instantly gravitated to this card and said, this is a great card for Targ Burn. I actually disagree. I think this is a great card for something like Dothraki. I think this is a great card for something like Targ Summer that only is dabbling in Burn. For a pure Targ Burn deck, I don't think she's the right answer. And the reason why is Targ Burn has a hard time claiming power. They are very, very slow. As we've seen, those games go to time more often than not, where you know Josh has had 13 power on his house and has to go for a modified win. And the reason why that she's a bad fit for that deck because of that reason is the other Daenerys makes your dragons that you have in play not kneel to attack. And one of those dragons gives all the other dragons 
Renown, which is one of the fastest and easiest ways for Targaryen to claim a consistent amount of power while playing Burn and still get all the cool triggered effects off those dragons. So I think you're going to find a lot of Targ players are going to slot this into their Burn decks, they're going to try it out, and maybe some will have some success with it, but I think they're going to find their power gain has been slowed down so significantly that they may pull it back out and go back to the old Danny. Now, if she had Renown on her, I think she would be fantastic. She's a great Fire Made Flesh target that Targ recently got. Um, I think she's fantastic for that type of card. I just don't know that she needs to go into a Burn deck where they don't have any problems removing characters off the board anyways. I think she adds something that Burn doesn't actually have a problem with right now. And I think she's great in something like a Targaryen Dothraki deck, or like I said, maybe even a Targ Summer deck that is using some other tech and just dabbling on the kill side. I kind of um, disagree on the point just because one of the banes that uh, Targaryen Burn has is armies. True. And armies, most of the times, cannot have attachments. She's the perfect target to kill those. And she is. You know. But again, we've seen Josh burn armies off the board it, multiple ones. It's doable. It's yes. just harder. Yeah, it's just, it's just it's not card advantage. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time to burn an army, you need to have two to three cards. Very true. Compared to her, she would just, you know. But if you're already going to time in a game, are you going to pull the cards out that are even, that are still getting you to time in a game, and you're still going to modified wins to slow your deck down even more to play her? Maybe, maybe not. Um... The other problem is, if she wasn't named an Aeris Targaryen, she'd be a fantastic card. Um, probably one of the biggest complaints I actually have about the prize cycle so far is we're seeing a lot of these cool cards come out, but they're just reprints of characters that already exist that already have awesome abilities. So yeah, does it make you have to have this hard choice about who to play? Sure. But did she really need to be Daenerys Targaryen? Could they not have found another card in the lore that this card could have been so that you wouldn't lose that ability to gain power and still had an awesome ability like you have on this card, which would have been an interesting thing to have seen as well. I think she's great, don't get me wrong. Um, again, I've dabbled in decks that run characters from other houses out of house, and I think she's a good slot maybe for you know a multi-house deck where you need some additional kill and you can do that kind of stuff. I'm just not sold that she's the answer for Targ Burn. I think she's the answer for other Targaryen decks, just not necessarily a Burn deck mm -hmm. per se. Yeah. Okay, we have another Targaryen card. Um, it's Cal. It's an attachment, uh, one cost, a title. Prize two, attached to a house card. Response, after you play the prize card, Neo attach house character to choose a character. That character gains deadly and does not kneel to attack or defend during power challenges until the end of the round. I like it. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's good. Um, the only th question I have is, is there enough prize? In in uh, Targaryen, you have the horse loads, well, ho mm -hmm. horse lords. They're not unique, so that's right three right there. Yep. Um, and the not kneel to attack and defend is pretty good. <laughs> it is, and remember, all these can only be triggered once per turn. Yeah. So the turn you play it, you're going to trigger it off itself. So that means the average game for most decks is what four, maybe five plot rounds. For target, goes a little bit longer because the burn is a slower deck, as we were just talking about. So maybe you'll want more abilities to trigger this. But look how well this combos with Daenerys. Again, this is another one of the titles where they actually got it right, in my opinion. Um, this works so well with the new Danny that you'll want to play them both in the same deck. You play this in a hair, uh, what is it, hair, hair to the Iron Throne, where you give up your military challenge to make two power challenges a turn, and now all of a sudden Danny is your military and your power challenge character that turn. So it allows Hair to the Iron Throne to run intrigue power only, give up the military, but still get the kill effects that you need to be able to control the board presence. And so again, this is why I'm saying this Danny works better in a, like a power rush deck, which we like haven't seen. Rocky, or just a straight up Hair to the Iron Throne deck. We've seen um, a couple of those decks running dragons, for example, come out. And I know that's kind of a bad example because of what I was saying about the renown for dragons, but they still have a place in those styled decks. And I know Josh was working on one recently where he was using a lot of the new attachments that we've seen to just make five co five strength tricon characters on the board for one cost attachment. Uh, Lady Danny's favor, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So, being able to tell like Daenerys Targaryen now, hey look, you're a four strength character who's going to be able to make two power challenges and an intrigue challenge this turn, and after every time I declare you as attacker because you don't kneel, I have the potential to kill a character as well. That's three characters dead in a single round just because of Danny and this card. I think they hit it out of the park with that combo. I think you're going to see it be pretty brutal. Even more importantly though, you know, use it on Horse Lord. You know, get two challenges out of him every turn that your opponent can't defend. I mean, why not? Yeah. And then you can save him because now he can defend because he didn't need to attack in the first place. 
And I really like this. I really like this a lot. Um, I think it even works on the Dragon decks. It will. Until you get Danny out. It does. You know. Um, it's it's pretty good. Anything that prevents you from kneeling to attack we've seen is very, very, very brutal and very, very powerful. It really screws with the challenge math for your opponent because now they have to take that character into account whether you actually commit him to the challenge or not. And you're always going to because why not? Yeah. Um, the other interesting thing is it grants deadly. So the really cool part about this is you're going to want to defend against Danny because you don't want to lose that challenge and watch your army get killed. But if you defend against her, you're going to lose the character anyways because of deadly. So I like how they put that extra twist in there. All right, this, <laughs> this, I said there's two cards in this pack that are going to be meta-defining. Um, in my opinion, like I said, I think cards like Tyrion Lannister and the Westerlands for Lannister specifically were two of those cards. This is the third one. This is the card that you will see define the meta going forward, probably all the way through Worlds at least. Um, this is Hall. This is the card everybody's been waiting for. This is a two gold, unique location. It's neutral house. It's a stronghold and it's Riverlands. Again, two traits that we may very well see come up in the next cycle as being you know, played off of for benefit. It's prize two. If Hall has three or more gold tokens on it, discard it from play, cannot be saved. Response, kill a character you control to cancel a triggered effect, then place one gold token on Hall. Let me start by saying when I first saw this card spoiled, I thought it was crap, I'll be honest. Having to kill my characters on the board to get an effect out of something is brutal. But then we saw things like Mummer's Ford come out. We saw an ability now in the game where you can consistently draw into multiple characters every turn to feed this card. And I think that's what makes this really, really fantastic. An aggro deck running Heron Hall is going to be wicked hard to deal with because you're not going to be able to trigger effects. They will kill their chuds all day long to cancel your abilities. So this cancels a plot? It does not cancel plots. Okay. Plots are not considered triggered effects. Okay. Um, so let's, let's talk about all the ways this card can just wreck people's faces and things you can do with it. So we'll start out with one of the houses that probably can get some of the most significant advantage out of this card, which is House Stark. Stalwart is a fantastic keyword now. Stalwart was the most horrible keyword in the game for the longest time. No Stark player will ever tell you they actually liked Stalwart characters. They thought they were garbage, they clog your draw, they always go back to the top of your deck when they die. You never want to see them come back around again, but they always do. They're the card you can't get rid of. Now you want to be getting rid of them every turn because they're dirt cheap. The exception of Ned Stark, most stalwart characters in Stark are, I think, two gold. So that basically means every turn you're spending two gold for the ability to cancel a triggered effect. Because you kill him and he goes right back to the top of your deck and you draw him again next turn. So this is really cool. Uh, House Lannister, all the Lannisport money lenders, the bronze hirelings, all the cheap little one cost characters that Lannister runs, I'll sack one of them to cancel a trigger effect. Why not? Especially since you want them early on for the gold, but mid game, you're like, why are you, oh, I got 13 gold. Yep. I don't need that. So the, using the trigger effect, killing a trigger effect later on will be more advantageous. So we've seen what happens, though, when we have responses that are very, very powerful that are not death-bound after they're done. We just saw it with Prince's plans getting re-ratted again for the third time. And now we have Heron Hall. I wonder if this card should not have been written to say once it has three or more gold tokens on it, it's moved to the death pile, the dead pile. Because as it stands right now, you'll be able to play this three times if you have three in your deck. Because a unique card in your discard pile can still be put into play again. So it makes me wonder That's if... That's probably you think the price too would be the... No, not at all. No. I will give you two power to trigger this three times any day of the week. So let's talk about some interesting ways that this card interacts that a lot of people right off the top of their head and if they haven't read the forums probably don't know. Um, the more abundant state in Game of Thrones is very confusing for a lot of players, especially newer players, or even players that have played the game for a long time. And the reason why this is important is because if you look at the way that phases resolve, this becomes more abundant discard, but does not actually get discarded until the entire response window is closed. Which means during a Valor turn, when you're playing against a Greyjoy player, for example, you can kill as many of your characters as you can because they're still more abundant dead to cancel as many of their saves as you want, even going over three gold tokens. Because this becomes more abundant discard, but not actually moved to the discard pile until the response window completely closes and everything gets removed from the board. This wrecks Greyjoy saves. As long as you have three characters on the board, or even actually, yeah, one, you need one character for every save they have on the board, you will cancel every single one of them before this goes to your discard pile. Wow. Um, this gets around some of the stupid things we're seeing out of Martell right now. Um, you think this was the answer for that? 
Um, you know, the, the year, right? I doubt it. These yeah. cards were designed, you know, a year ago at least, I would say. You know, I don't know FFG's development cycle. None of us really do. But you have to imagine this card was probably at least basically designed a couple a year ago or so. I think what they discovered was there's a lot of triggered effects in the game now, and nobody has a consistent amount of access to ways to cancel this, and they wanted to give every house the ability to do so. Um, this is definitely a one-of in every deck if you're building right now, in my opinion, if not a two or a three-of, depending on your meta. Um, I will run this as a 3 of in Lannister only because I'm sick and tired of getting my butt handed to me by Targ Burn, and this walks all over them. Oh, uh, Forever Burning is a perfect example. The only way they can get Forever Burning back is if it goes to their death pile, which is what it happens after you play Forever Burning. It goes dead, they can kneel an influence at the dominance phase and return it. If you cancel it, goes, cancel, it goes to discard, they can never get it back. Yeah. I will run this and kill my own characters <laughs> any day of the week. You're going to die anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to cancel those cards, get them into the dead pile or the discard pile where you want them to be and they can't get them back. Um, I think there's so many ways. I mean, this cancels the titles. These are responses. You have this in play turn one and somebody drops a title, sorry, you're never getting any benefit out of the game anymore. Or even better, let's say you have your title in play and you're playing a target player who has Viserys. Cancel his effect. You're not discarding my title. You're not discarding my attachment that I wanted to keep. This card has so many uses, I think it's actually going to help define the meta going forward there, for a very another very hole? This is the only one. Um, I think we have a second one, but it's Stark only. Stark only. Okay. Yeah. Last of the titles, um, and I like that they're giving love to neutral. <laughs> neutral. Um, it's an attachment, one cost, the Brave Companions, unique. It's a title, prize one, attached to a neutral faction house card. Response, after a neutral card, neutral character you own leaves play, new attach house card to attach that character face down to the Brave Companions instead. Marshalling, Neo attach house card to return and attach face down character to your hand. I like it. I like it. Um, it helps keep your guys in play, you know, your unique guys. So when I play Neutral House Faction, I automatically try to go with this, the um, Long Voyage. Mm -hmm. And um, with the Long Voyage, I don't want to play three copies of, of a lot of cards, so this lets me, you know, keep my unique guys. Um, I like it. I like it. It is. It is in some type. It's kind of a card draw. Yeah. Because you're getting that card back into your hand. Um, important to note, it's the first title we've seen that is actually restricted to a specific house card, which is interesting. You can't oh, play this out true. of any other houses. Um, to me, this actually reads like I wonder if it was originally an agenda that they converted over to this instead. This seems like a very agenda-like effect that you would see coming out of neutral. Or, I think, the, the problem I have with this card is, I would have liked to have seen attached to any house card, but I know that probably would have been broken very easily because now all your characters get attached. Um, somebody brought up a very good point again on the forums, I think today or yesterday, and I hate to go back to Viserys again as an idea, but the moment this gets discarded, every character you've attached to it goes to your discard pile too. You lose them. But they don't go to the dead pile. You no, they go to the discard pile, which is nice because you which can play them again. Um, I just, I, I like the fact they're trying to help neutral out. I just don't think this is what neutral needs to be competitive right now. I think they needed more. I, yeah, they do need more, but at least it's, a, it's in the right direction. Um, it's basically a free card every turn. Yeah. Is what it, 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 kneels, it kneels out to the, at the end of the day. It's a free card. Um, in an average game, you'll maybe get three, four out of this, and that's it. Which is fine. Maybe that, that's a good, a good enough. It'll save the powerhouse Jamie Lannister neutral. <laughs> it, it very well could. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, the problem is, I almost would have wanted to see this to have been three gold, and allowed you to probably put that character back into play, instead of going back to your yeah. hand. And that's probably, I mean, I, I, maybe there would have been some other way to balance this card out, where it would have been kneel the house card and put that character back into play, without having to pay its cost. Because I think that actually would have given neutral some serious legs to be able to just say, oh, you killed this character, like Jamie, for example. Yeah. Now next turn, you know he's just going to come right back into play. Yeah. I think that would have been a lot interesting. Because like Jamie as an example, now you're paying two to put him into shadows. Now you're going to have to pay two more to bring him back out. So it's kind of iffy. Um, it's great for dupes. You know, you kill a dupe character, the, the dupe gets attached to the Brave Companions. You can pull the dupe back to your hand next turn and then drop it back down, right? I mean... Oh... Well, I guess actually no, because the dupe's not really considered a character when it's even play, is it? Is it? I don't think so. I think it's just considered a card. 
I'd have to look. Okay. But I mean, that would be an interesting use for it, being able if to say dupes on some yeah. characters. But you probably don't run a lot of dupes anyways in neutral TLB decks, because really that deck just wants a lot of characters. Um, maybe this is setting you up to play a neutral deck that runs characters from every house. We've seen a plot that Oh, gives... it only works in neutral house. Well, neutral house character. card. Is a neutral character? Yeah, after a neutral Oh, character. okay. Yeah, yeah that helps to read the card a little bit better. <laughs> so even then... I mean, text. So there you go. Had this even been any character while you're playing neutral... We saw the plot that just came out where it's X claim for every house that you're running. This maybe would have been great with that. I mean, if I'm already going to have to pay the gold penalty anyways to play all those characters, give me some way of at least keeping them around, yeah. maybe. So, All right. The one agenda in the pack. This is uh, Dark Wings, Dark Words. Um, this is an agenda. Uh, your minimum deck size is 75 cards. You cannot have more than one copy of each event by title in your deck. You cannot trigger event card effects from your dead or discard pile. Response. After you play an event, draw one card. And this was designed by the 2011 Game of Thrones World Melee Champion, Corey Faraday. This is a fun agenda. This is not a competitive agenda at all. This is something you will play to have fun with your friends, maybe build a, a, a silly deck that you want to mess around with. Um, there is no reason you will run this in a competitive deck, in my opinion. And the reason why, when I'm building a deck, there's never any time I go, wow, I wish I could run 15 one-copy events in my deck. I just don't. I want to run three copies of Harry the Riverlands. I want to run three copies of No Quarter, or two copies of No Quarter, or whatever the case may be. There's never a situation where I go, this event is mediocre enough that I only want to have one in there. You never, won, you never run one Nightmares. You never run one Paper Shield. You're going to put at least two in the deck. So the other problem I have with this, too, is it's forcing you to use events at inopportune times to take advantage of the agenda. So you're turning off your No Agenda tech, or you're just not using a better agenda, and then you're also being forced into playing event cards consistently every turn just to take advantage of the agenda you put into play. So how many times have you had a Nightmares in your hand, and you've looked at your opponent's board and go, really, there's nothing I want to blank, but I need to keep this just in case he plays something. Now with this, you're going to look at that Nightmares and go, well, geez, if I don't play it, I'm wasting my agenda this turn because I'm not getting any card draw off it. And it's draw, too. It's not even reveal and add to hand, which bypasses the draw cap. So any faction right now that has consistent draw is never going to run this anyways, because what's the point? Now, maybe Martell, who's the king of events, would find some use for this, but even then, they want to play lots of copies of things like Red Vengeance or Burning on the Sands. Are you really going to play one Burning on the Sands that you could never recur out of your discard pile or your dead pile? No, you're not going to at all. So I just really struggle to find out what deck wants to dilute itself to 75 cards, and each one of those is going to be a single copy of an event at that point, because the assumption is you're going to run 15 events that are one copy. Maybe you'll run five events, but then what's the point of even running the agenda and going to 70 cards, not playing, you know? Yeah. So I'm very, I struggle to figure out where this card fits in the game. It's very well designed. I mean, I think it's a well designed, it's not broken at all. It's not like Knights of the Hollow Hill, as we've seen, which has dominated for so long. Um, I just look at it and I go, oh, maybe somebody who's a better deck builder than myself will find a use for this. But Diluting your deck, as we've seen, is horrible. You don't want to go over 60 cards because it ruins your chance and your odds of drawing those cards that you want to see. So, Yeah, when I first looked at it, I the first agenda that has this kind of the same text, in a sense, was TLV. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, could we, can this be the new TLV? But, um, but unless they make a card or a location that lets you take events from the graveyard and put them back into your hand mm -hmm. um, or takes all your, your your events to make it more cons consistent to play this it will be the only time I'll see so to note there's only one house right now that I think can take advantage of this even though they never would want to but that can actually use it to a more consistent effect and that's Baratheon Baratheon has two cards that allows them to actually almost abuse this card um, the first one being Robert Baratheon um, they have ruled specifically that his ability, which allows you to play events out of your discard pile, is not restricted by the restriction on this card. Because he is, his ability specifically says, as if you were playing them from your hand. Oh, okay. So it gets around this thing where you cannot play it from your discard pile because you're really not playing it from your discard player because yeah. he changes the effect as a playing from your hand. Yeah. So in that case, yeah, you can play one copy of that event and then use him, if you really want to, to recur that event multiple times. It's not really the optimal play. <laughs> I don't know why you would give it up over things like Black Sails or Knights of the Realm. I mean, I just don't know why you would change your agenda. Um, the other one is, again, Baratheon, Empire of the False Gods. When you play an event, it goes to the bottom of your deck. 
So maybe you could build some weird deck where you just consistently play bad events or just <laughs> random events anyways to get consistent amounts of draw to your deck every turn because those events are just cycling down to the bottom of your deck, you know? So I, I play an event, I don't know, I'll, I'll blank that card, it goes to the bottom of my deck, and I'll draw the top card. Oh, it's something I can actually use like a character or a location, now I can play it or whatever. But again, you're giving up either no agenda tech or a good agenda for something that I just don't know where it fits right now. And maybe we'll see something in the future. You never know. You never know. Yeah. But, you know, as, like I said, as a world champion card, I think it's very well designed. So. It'd be cool if it was every time anybody plays an event card, draw a card. I think that would be fantastic. Oh, that would be awesome. Because think about playing against Martel. Like, are they going to give you card draw to play an event card every turn? Maybe they actually would think about it before they did, you know? Or, hey, you want to no-quarter my guy? That's fine. Kill him. I'm going to draw a card on him. So deck. all the restriction, except for the response being any card, any event played? Yeah. I think that would have been interesting had it been anytime anybody plays an event card. And that would be been awesome because since the card was designed for uh, melee. melee, it would be great in melee. And it's draw, so you're still going to hit yeah. the draw cap. Yeah. So it wouldn't be broken in melee. I mean, I might get my draw cap every turn off it because you guys are going to play events, but I'm just going to hit the draw cap and that's it. So I don't know. I've, I've always wondered if we're ever going to see some ability to play two agendas. Like... And I could see this being cool. Like, imagine if you could play, like, you know, Power Behind the Throne in this, maybe, or something. Where you just have some janky deck that allows you, for some random card effect, says you can have two agendas in play. An agenda that tells you you can play two more agendas. Yeah, you know, something. <laughs> and that would be cool with something like this. But yeah. I, just, I just don't see where it fits. But again, you know, I wasn't a big fan of uh, City of Shadows for the longest time. And I've been playing the hell out of it recently. And I've actually found a way to make it work. So maybe somebody out there will find a way to make this work and it'll be a fantastic agenda. I just think it's a fun agenda. I think it's something you would play in a casual game just to see how cool it might be, it be. and that's it. So. so what do you think all around, all around from this pack? Um, one of the best packs in the cycle. Um, I think a lot of houses got what they needed out of here. I think Martell, surprisingly enough, got the short end of the stick, which maybe it's about time they did finally. <laughs> um, people say that you know, Martell's not as dominant as everybody thinks they are. Um, I tend to disagree given their performance last year at Gen Con. We saw how well they won. Um, we saw how well they did at Worlds even though they didn't win. And we're seeing how well they're doing right now. So Martell getting the short end of the stick for a little bit maybe isn't such a bad idea. Um, they can't fix the problems with, new, with cards that are coming because the cards have already been designed. So we're not going to see a lot of answers come out until maybe even possibly the next cycle or the cycle after. And with the upcoming announcement in November, it's going to be interesting to see if we even see an announcement for a cycle after the next one that's coming up. Because by the time the new cycle starts, which is in September, assuming that they go back to back and we don't miss yeah. a month, we only have two months before whatever the FFG announcement is in November, which we all suspect is going to do something about the card pool and the size that it's at. So it'll be interesting to see what cards get printed in the new cycle to support these things that they've been telling us compared to what they're going to do with the card pool. Because... So you think that they this announcement they've been planning for this long? You I, think? I think they're gonna either. I think we're gonna see FFG probably move the tournament formats for any FFG sanctioned tournament to a restricted set of cycles. And I would not be surprised if it was something like you can run the core set, the house box, and the last three cycles worth of cards in an FFG tournament sanctioned tournament. Which you know, if you look at their current rules for like Netrunner, for example, or even Star Wars. Those rulings already exist in there. We actually, even in the, the new FAQ for Game of Thrones, it's in the back where it actually says, these are the cycles that are actually allowed in an FFG sanctioned tournament, mm -hmm. which they usually define as store championships, regionals, uh, nationals, and then worlds. So maybe your local events won't have to comply with those unless they want to. But I, I think we're going to see something along that line happen. They have to do something about the size. So it'll be interesting to see the rest of this cycle and going into the next cycle, if those cards that are coming out were already designed with this intent that they knew was coming up that they were gonna have to do something or if this announcement about what's happening in November was something that they just all of a sudden made a decision for mid-cycle. That's what I think. Is that, I don't know if they've been thinking about doing this for, for a year ago. Yeah. If, we th if we think the development cycle is a year, if they're ahead, um, a yeah. year ahead, um, that means they would have had to think about this last year and then, you know, but we'll see. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see the announcement. I think FFG will do what's best for the game yep. you know um, and as a store owner um, it is the biggest drawback for new players they see the card pool and they get intimidated and very big very quick and regardless how many times I tell them two cores and a deluxe will give you a competitive deck they see the card pool and they see it still say no so um, we'll see so 
hopefully you liked it. This is our, our first video of um, unboxing. We're hopefully we'll be do, doing some more and um, doing some more of the other games too. Um, and if you like it, like the video. If you have any comments, uh, me and uh, Angela will look at the comments and try to answer everything. And um, thank you. And thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye bye.